Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the Roman world at the birth of the church in our continuing study of a history of Christianity. We left off with Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, that says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. We asked the question, in what ways was this the fullness of time? And the Roman world at this time in history uh, had, was, was pulled together by Roman roads. It was the period of Pax Romana. That had not been the case 50 years earlier. It would not be the case later on. But this time in history, uh, you, had a, uh, you, you had a unified empire, the peace of Rome, and a common language that bound the empire together. Interestingly enough, it was not Latin. Uh, yes, Latin was the language of Rome and of Italy, but Greek was the common language, and all cultured people spoke Greek, so that Paul could even write an epistle to the church at Rome, and he could write it in Greek, and he could uh, be assured that it would be read and understood. Our story is going to begin, really, uh, back in, the, uh, in, in around 67 uh, BC, a little bit er, uh, later than that, with Pompey the Great. Uh, Pompey the, it's, it's interesting, most people call themselves, uh, are called the Great by later on in history. Uh, Pompey had actually given himself that title, Pompus Magnus, uh, Magnus uh, Pompey the Great. And he had been commissioned by Rome to take care of a serious problem. Uh, the problem was one of piracy. And so he was given special powers. It was reasoned uh, that it would take him maybe five years to get rid of the pirates who were interrupting the grain shipments coming from Egypt. Instead of taking him five years, he did it in three months. And within three months, he had sailed to Greece. That was the, the area where, where most of them were based. And he had dealt with the pirates. But now he had another four years and counting of special powers. And so he continued on his way to the east. He was in Syria uh, when it came to his attention, uh, certain issues that were taking place down in Jerusalem. Uh, two rival brothers were vying or power there, two Jewish brothers, and they had each sent a message to him saying, can you come and get rid of this brother of mine? And he said, okay. And he marched down to Jerusalem, and he captured the city of Jerusalem. Capturing Jerusalem, he actually entered the temple that was considered uh, a huge infraction, but he had the, the army to back him up. He wanted to see what the God of the Israelites looked like. Uh, inside of every temple, you would always have a statue of the God. And, of course, he went into the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Jerusalem, and there was nothing there. You say, well, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? That had been missing for 500 years. Uh, that hadn't been there since the days of the first temple when it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And so Pompey left, but in doing so, he left uh, somebody of his own appointing in charge of of the area which he now renamed it had been called Judah before he renames that Judea and other provinces like Galilee and Samaria would now come into effect coming back to Rome after the fact Pompey entered into a secret agreement secrets don't always say secret so it was a three-way agreement uh, called the First Triumvirate, and we call it the First Triumvirate because there's going to be another one, uh, a young up-and-coming politician by the name of Julius Caesar, and Crassus, an old, uh, uh, he, Crassus was just known for being filthy rich. He was the money man uh, between the three of them. And they agreed secretly to split up the empire between themselves. And so Pompey would be there as the consul in Rome. Consul was, uh, they had a president, but actually they would have two at a time uh, who would be appointed for a year. So Pompey was there in Rome. Caesar had been the consul previously. So now he became the governor of Gaul. And Crassus was a little jealous over these other two who had, who had both been military men. And so Crassus, it was agreed that he would... Uh, uh, take the armies to the east and fight, fight with the Parthians. That didn't go so well. He, he was defeated uh, early on in his, in his campaign, uh, and he was put to death. And this left Caesar and Pompey, as I said, the two military men. And it wasn't long 
before these two came into conflict one with the other. It erupted into a major civil war, a civil war that Julius Caesar won, Pompey lost. And so Caesar now, uh, with the defeat of Pompey, became the undisputed ruler of the world. Uh, he went down and conquered Egypt. Pompey had actually run to Egypt, and, and he got down there and uh, in order to ingratiate themselves with Caesar, uh, the Egyptians had taken him, taken Pompey, cut off his head. Uh, that really wasn't what Caesar wanted. He, he used to like to forgive his enemies, and that way uh, they would owe him big, and he would sh be showing himself how magnanimous, how wonderful, and how forgiving he was. Uh, so he didn't get the, the chance to do that with Pompey. But he, um, he did make some arrangements in Egypt, uh, placing on the throne not the young Ptolemy the Thirteenth, but instead his older sister Cleopatra, and so she enters the the picture, uh, and she and, and Caesar actually had a son together. So it was more than just politics; there was perhaps a little bit of matchmaking that had taken place. And so Cleopatra becomes the ruler of Egypt, and yet it's with Caesar in control. And now he comes back to Rome, where he is appointed, uh, given the appointment. Remember how how we'd had Pompey given special powers. Caesar says, I want those special powers, and I want them for life. So he's appointed dictator for life by the Senate. And uh, he institutes a number of reforms. One of the reforms that he does, he changes the calendar. He doesn't put it to a vote. He doesn't let the Senate do it. He says, this is the way the calendar is going to be. He actually uh, possibly had brought the, the calendar they were using in uh, in Egypt that had a 365-day year. And, and uh, of course, uh, it would go out of whack every every uh, four years. It would go one day one day out. And, and the Egyptians knew that, and they just, they just let it go. Uh, uh, Caesar brings the calendar back and he imposes it upon the uh, upon the Romans and he even has a name a month named after him. Uh, we call it the month of July for Julius Caesar. However, the Romans are afraid that he's going to make himself a king. You say, well, he was already dictator. What's the difference between that? and a king. To the Romans, it made all the difference in the world because the Romans, early in their history, had fought a great battle to get rid of their kings. And so they did not want a king, and they were afraid that, that Caesar was going to make himself a king. So on the Ides of March, they assassinated Julius Caesar. He actually uh, fell down and died with, with these knife wounds at the feet of the statue of Pompey there in the Senate. Now, this left a power vacuum that was quickly filled by three people. One of them was Octavius, the young nephew of Julius Caesar. In fact, when Julius Caesar's will was read, it was learned, and Octavius learned it himself, that he had been legally adopted as the son of Julius Caesar. Uh, the, third, the second part, uh, part of his party was Mark, Mark Antony, Marcus Antonius, his, his full name was, and he had been the right-hand man to Julius Caesar, a military man, cavalry commander, uh, one who was always there in a pinch. And they got a third partner, Lepidus, who was a, a an older general. And they came out with a second triumvirate. Now, the first triumvirate had been, had been secret. This was not secret. This was all done out in the open. And so with this second triumvirate, you have... You have uh, Octavius, who is going to be there in Rome as the consul. You have Mark Antony, who will be given command of the armies to the east, where Cleopatra is. And it's not long before he has, he has actually uh, been swept away with Cleopatra and even married her and is giving her all sorts of honors that are supposed to belong to Rome. And, of course, Lepidus, he's given uh, North Africa. We're not going to hear too much from Lepidus. But the real conflict will, be, will come between Octavius, representing the Roman Senate, and, and Antony, who is representing Cleopatra. So that the Senate declares war, not on Mark Antony. The Senate declares war on Cleopatra, but... <laughs> 
Mark Antony is married to her. And so you have this second civil war that takes place, and Octavius comes out as the winner. Now, I don't want to say that he won the war. He did come out as the winner. He didn't actually do the fighting. He, did, he realized his shortcomings as a military man. He was, he was not a general, but he had a great ability to pick the right person for the job, and he picked his lifelong friend, uh, uh, Antipater who is going to be, uh, I'm sorry, not uh, Agrippa. What, what was I saying? Agrippa, in fact, we're going to have some uh, children of Herod the Great, uh, also named Agrippa. That's where they're getting the name from. He, he picks his friend Agrippa to command the battle. And one of the things that the two of them had done before they had their falling out, back in 40 BC, Herod the Great had come to Rome who had been kicked out by the Jews, and they had appointed him as king of the Jews. And so this has already uh, set the stage, and, and Herod was actually supposed to be on Mark Antony's side uh, at, the, at that final battle. He wasn't able to be there, um, but he was allowed to remain as king of the Jews by Octavius, now that Octavius has become the new ruler of the Roman Empire. I say new ruler of the Roman Empire? Well, he was in reality, but that is not the way he portrayed himself. He said, I don't want to be a dictator. I don't want to be a king. Uh, you can think of me as just an advisor. And so he left the Senate in place. Uh, he let them make the not too important decisions, but he would be there to advise them. And he said, you can call me the the principus, the first citizen. Uh, I'm just a citizen. I'm just a private citizen here to advise you. Now, the Senate had given him the title Augustus, the August one, um, the one that we can turn to for advice and leadership. And so begins with his reign, the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying there were no conflicts anywhere, but it was a period of relative peace. Uh, from his beginning, 31 uh, BC, where you had the Battle of Actium between he and Antony, uh, all the way up to his death, you have a period of relative peace. It's going to be during this period that Jesus is born. It's also a quote that he will leave before he dies. He'll, he will say, I found Rome brick. I left her marble. That is a picture of how Rome was developed from a city of wood and shacks and things like that into a glorious city you, you can still go today and walk through the ruins of the Roman Forum in, in central Rome and see the handiwork of Octavius Augustus, uh, who had left these, uh, these monuments that still stand today. Now, Octavius had appointed his son, well, he didn't have a, a surviving son. Instead, he adopted uh, his son-in-law, Tiberius, to become the next emperor. And Tiberius actually ruled as regent. Uh, and then a couple of years later, when, when Octavius finally died, he, he ruled then as the emperor uh, of the Roman Empire. It's during his period that the crucifixion of Jesus takes place. Uh, I doubt that Tiberius ever heard of Jesus because, after all, uh, that was a, a sort of a, a Messiah in a far off corner of the world that that nobody outside of that area, at the time at least, heard about. Now, this was the period of the Roman procurators. Rome had the idea that people other than Romans should pay for the taxes of the empire. And so all throughout the empire, you had Roman governors. Uh, the title was usually given as procurators, although sometimes you might have a military person in which he would be a precept. Um, but the Roman procurators, their job was to procure the taxes. It was laughingly said that a Roman procurator usually spent his first year in office paying off all the bribes, collecting taxes to pay off all the bribes that had gotten him into office. And then he would spend his second year in office uh, collecting taxes and skimming off the top to pay off all of the bribes that he'd have to pay to keep himself out of prison when he got thrown out of office. And then years three and following, he would spend collecting taxes, skimming off the top, giving Rome her share, but skimming off the top for his future retirement fund. 
one of these procurators, actually, uh, we have since learned, we used to think that Pontius Pilate was a procurator. He had the title of prefect, which is a, a sort of a, a step up from a procurator, still had the same responsibility to uh, collect the taxes, but he was a military man, had that higher um, um, title. And when Pontius Pilate, he, uh, he, he governs in, in Judea, beginning in 26 AD, when he first came to Judea, he had the Roman standards, these eagles and big plaques that had Roman symbols upon them, brought into Jerusalem uh, late one night when nobody was looking. And the Jews took that as a sign of bringing idols into the city. And they had a... Uh, a, a meeting. They came down to see him at his capital in Caesarea. Jerusalem was not the capital. The uh, city on the sea was Caesarea. And they said, you have to take those out. And he said, I'm not going to take those out. I'm, you know, They represent Rome. You must take them out. And he says, if you don't leave my sight, I will have you all killed. And each of the Jewish people there bared his neck and said, strike away. We will not abide pagan pagan idols, and he didn't know what to do about that. So he he uh, he had the standards removed. Second issue was a theft of money where t where he went in and and had money taken from the temple treasury to pay for waterworks. He figured, well, this is uh, a work that's going to benefit the Jews, and so they can pay for it. And he stole the money from the temple. Uh, this led to a big scuffle, and a number of Jewish people, some that were in the midst of that scuffle, some that had just gone to worship that day in the temple, uh, a great number of Jewish people were killed in the temple. In fact, this incident is mentioned in Luke chapter 13, when the disciples come to Jesus and say, have you heard about what happened, about how there were those whose blood Pilate mingled with the sacrifices there in the temple, and, and they want to talk about that. And Jesus instead wants to talk about their need for repentance, and, and he takes the conversation quite a, quite a different way. A third incident took place when somebody said that they had found treasure on Mount Gerizim that was in Samaria, right next to that uh, town called Sychar, where Jesus had met with a Samaritan woman. And you know, all you have to do is say, hey, there's gold in that hill. And, and all of a sudden, everybody started converging on it, looking, looking for treasure. And Pilate had heard about their people gathering together. It must be a revolt. And he sent in his soldiers, and again, uh, there were a number of people killed. It would be in the year 36 AD that Pilate, that was just too much, and Pilate would be removed from office, and he goes into obscurity. But before that takes place, we have that instance recorded in all four of the Gospels. It is that instance, before he's recalled to Rome, that Jesus is brought before him. And of course, you know the story, how there's already a tension in the air where, where Pilate is at odds with the, with the other Jewish leaders, uh, with the high priests, uh, with this uh, tetrarch up in, in Galilee by the name of Herod Antipas. And they're bringing Jesus, saying, we want him executed. Well, what, you know, what's the reason? Uh, and they can't come up with a good reason. And, and he resists initially. And yet, as they accuse him of being politically incorrect, they say, uh, this man is making himself a king, and we, ha we have no king but Caesar. And you say, wait a minute, I thought that they didn't call Caesar's kings. Well, they didn't. At least the Romans didn't. O others had no qualms about that. And finally, Pilate, in, in a bit of desperation, calls for water. And Pilate washes his hands, saying, I wash my hands of the whole thing. You take him. You can take him and crucify him. He gives permission to do so. But he says, it's not my responsibility. And as you read the account, you get a sense, yes, the Jews are trying to take the responsibility upon themselves. They actually cry out, his blood be upon our heads and upon the heads of our children. Uh, uh, a frighteningly prophetic statement that they make. And yet as Pilate washes his hands, it reminds us 
that you must decide what to do with Jesus. We must all decide what to do with Jesus. We cannot wash our hands. We cannot be neutral. You must either decide that he is the Messiah and treat him as such, or else you must reject him. But you cannot remain neutral.